on a marriage of less than two years duration. And the second is a very small set, but important nonetheless, employment-based visas to investors. When these individuals receive a green card, they have they have to remove the conditionality restrictions within two years. We're going to come back to that. Moreover, when you receive a green card, legal permanent residence is indefinite, but the green card is not. The green card must be renewed. It expires in 10 years. So the visa process continues. And in a longitudinal study, we want to know what's going on. It is, is the individual renewing the green card or not? And if not, why not? Is the individual removing the conditionality restrictions? Yes. So this becomes terribly important and it, and it displays the dynamic character of immigration. Uh, the migration process um, is dynamic and it continues at very long. And it continues in still further ways. Because the new green card recipient can now sponsor new immigrants. Moreover, the new green card recipient will at some point become eligible to become a citizen, either by naturalizing as an adult or by deriving citizenship as a child. And again, these are important dynamic things that happen over time. So cross-section data would never provide the information that is required to understand it. Then there is emigration. Not all green card recipients remain. They leave. And of course, it's terribly important to understand who leaves, how long, they, how long they're away, do they ever come back? What about their children? Do the children remain in the U.S., et cetera, et cetera? And then many other things that continue over time. Now, some children, for example, we said uh, uh, in this, one of the things that I skipped on this slide was that the new green card recipient may want to sponsor a green card for a child. And so immediately you wonder why? Why? Why didn't the child get a green card at, at the same time as the parents? And this slide, and I don't have time to go over everything, but this slide pulls together the five reasons why a child may be ineligible for a green card when the child's parents receive a green card. All right? So again, this dynamic nature of migration. And these non-LPR children of new LPRs, they're going to be sponsored in the future. And of course, we want to know where they are. And if they are in the U.S., what status are they in? I pulled, pulled together some information on naturalization, but I'm going to skip it. The reason it's here is that we don't understand the environment that the new green card recipient faces unless we understand the law on acquiring citizenship. So I'm skipping that. Okay. The science of migration. When you study migration, there are four central answers, and they concern Migrants at entry, this is usually called the selection question. Then migrants' characteristics and behavior changing over time. This is usually called the assimilation question. And then questions about their children, the second generation question. And finally, the question of impacts of migration on the origin and destination countries. Now, throughout, there is a unifying thread. And this unifying thread I think is most eloquently expressed in classical words from an unknown Latin author. For one is well off, there is one is home. What's important about that? Well, among many other things, it signals all the dimensions of being well off. It's not merely economic, it's not merely political, it's not merely it's whatever a person, whatever contributes to a person's happiness. And immediately you see that there's a link between migration and virtually every domain of the human experience. Identity, language acquisition, 
civic virtue, very important. And so studying migration opens the door <coughs> to watching these processes unfold over time. So longitudinal studies are the ideal approach. So now a few words about the rule of aggression. The objective is to create a new public use database on legal immigrants and their children that will help answer fundamental questions about migration behavior and the impacts of immigration. And there's a history of lots and lots of people and panels and gatherings such as this gathering here contributed to the development of that design. The principal investigators, the sources of support, and the design. First, representative samples of brand new green card recipients, including both new arrivals and adjustees. And this is critical. A person can get a green card when they're away. Say, say they are living in Bolivia, they get a green card, they show up in the U.S. with a green card. That's a new arrival. Or a person can be studying in the U.S. or a temporary worker in the U.S. and adjust to legal permanent residence and that way get the green card. Many, many previous designs for this type of longitudinal study had excluded adjustees. And yet adjustees are critically important behaviorally, and numerically it turns out they over, they're over half the set of new green card recipients in the program, by 55, 56%. So this new design would obtain information about the state of immigrant plus, Family members in the household, family members elsewhere, others in the household, and children, including those born here. It would re interview them periodically. This is the longitudinal aspect. Also, obtain histories, retrospective, uh, um, uh, as well as prospective, and do child assessment. <coughs> so, this basically tells us how to, how to get that, that first step. Persons in the sample. Now, because this design had never been tried before, and nobody knew if it would work, and if it could work, how much would it cost, and how could one make it cost whatever, we did a pilot. And it turns out that that pilot, based on people who got their green cards in 1996, uh, has been very useful substantively. And we, I believe, and, and, and I hope I can, I can persuade you that it will continue to be very important. Provided, as you will see in one of my last slides, provided it is possible to do some linkage to administrative records. Uh, all right, the 2003 cohort is the first major cohort of the NIS. So you see here the target population was everybody who got their green card in the seven months of 2003. I'm going to skip a lot of the fine points of the design because we really don't have time. But, but all the information is on the web, and of course you can write here, and I'd be delighted to send you uh, the information. The bottom line is nationally represented. Now, language. Immigrants appear with lots and lots of native languages. So early on, the team of PIs developed a basic principle. This was interview all respondents in the language of their choice. This means that it would be possible to show up at home and use one language for the sampled adult immigrant, a different language for that sampled adult immigrant spouse, and still a different language for that immigrant's child, age eligible child. Okay? This was extremely demanding. We worked very hard to develop a, a, a protocol that I'm going to skip over, except to tell you that at baseline rounds, interviews were conducted in 95 languages. By the way, that has an effect on most 
because it wasn't always the way a possible to find an interviewer or an interpreter with the right language at the right place. And in, so in, in those cases, the interviews were conducted by telephone. And you can ask me more about mode and I will have you the response rate, which for that population at that time in the U.S. is considered more than respectable for some years, uh, 68% for the adult sample and 64 for the child sample. I'm going to skip over this. This is a very fine detail in family. <coughs> uh, questionnaires cover everything that you might be interested in, that any immigration institution might be interested in. Child so the idea was to have subsequent runs every three to four years, plus choose a new cohort either five years later or whenever some big change in, in the world warranted. That new cohort has not materialized, and, and hopefully I will have a couple of minutes to tell you about that. Uh, the, something about the immigration climate changed in the United States, and we can no longer, at the present time, we can no longer draw a random sample of the population in the five percentage cases. If you're interested, you can ask me more about that. I have every hope that that privacy curtain will be lifted and that there will again be another cohort. And of course, aligned with that, there's other information that we want. You can see a little bit more about that. And it depends, our getting it depends on that privacy curtain being lifted. Okay, here you see the language design for the second round. And as you can see, we learned from the first round. We learned that there were some languages we had not planned for, which were important, like in Japan. Uh, and again, we have the, the keys of the interviewer. The questionnaires at the second round update all information from round one, job history, birth history, for example, language use, religion. Um, and in the child sample, children who reach 18 years of age are now administered the adult questionnaire from the first round. So that we, that we, we bring them into the adult the response rate was 45% uh, uh, in the second run. And this, uh, after much, much uh, thinking and, and discussing moving protocols and sitting down with all the, the field organizations, um, this is the 2006-2007-2008 the, the are the years when the immigration climate in the U.S. changed drastically and quickly. Part of what happened is that everyone became afraid of deportation. And as everyone in this room knows from the figures of uh, deportation, those fears were realistic. Yeah. There was a time, there was a time when we thought that green card recipients had nothing to be afraid of, right? They had the green card. So what if they're not a citizen yet and could be deported? So what if even if they became a citizen, they could be denaturalized and deported? They still had a big measure of support that we have. Well, guess what? As we're going to see on this slide very quickly, it turns out that a very large proportion of new green card recipients are previous illegals. Moreover, it turns out that many green card recipients live with illegals, have unauthorized persons in their families, in their homes. So it is not difficult to understand that they were very apprehensive of participating in that second round. All right, we still have the scientific questions to answer for the sample. Who will become a citizen and when? Uh, 
Uh, will they naturalize? Will the children derive citizenship? Will they be sponsoring uh, uh, relatives to get green cards? And if so, which relatives and when? Um, and obviously, it'll be important to analyze the links between those behaviors and residents and co residents and remittances and the will be the US and when. And that's where you can get the data. So now let's look at it. Let's take a very brief look at the data. I'm, I'm going to go right, I'm going to go right to the uh, illegal experiment one, which is the, this helps us understand the second one. And by the way, all of us are of a mind with data here. Uh, when the third round comes, well, as I said, I am hopeful that it will. When the third round comes, we're going to go back to everybody, whether or not they, they participated in the second round. So a total of almost 39% of new green card recipients were previously in the U.S. in an unauthorized status. And by the way, that's a lower bound because there are other ways they could have become illegal that we were not able to detect, such as working without permission in certain cases. Okay. This just pulls together the percent formerly illegal by visa status. So you can see that among persons who get their green cards by marrying a US citizen, and that's far and away the largest group. Half, around half, had previous illegal experience. Um, I'm going to, in the interest of time, I'll go ahead and ask me, and I'll be happy to come back and, uh, and look at that. Uh, I'll skip those, but I don't want, there's something at the bottom of this slide that is very interesting. One of the questions at the baseline uh, was about the intention to stay in the and there are three response categories that you can see. No, uncertain, yes. And then you see the proportions for the total and for those with previous illegal experience. And one of the fascinating things is that persons who have been in the U.S. illegally have a larger, a larger proportion of saying, yes, they will stay in the U.S. Now, every time I see I think of how hard they worked for this, and now they have it, and they want to keep it. And it also makes me think of Jacob working 14 years to marry Rachel. Um, <laughs> something precious that they have. Now, we do have those one two data, and they're starting to be used. They're available for public use. Uh, uh, lots of people around the world are using them, I'm using them. And this slide, the next slide shows that if all we looked at in the world were visa grounds, country of origin, there's not much difference between the composition in round one and round two. Of course, as everybody in this room knows, there's all those other things that we lump together as unobserved heterogeneity that are at work. And so we have to use all our best statistical and quantitative tools to deal with this. Now, I'm going to linger a little on this question of sponsorship. This was asked in the second round. Since you became a legal permanent resident, have you yourself filed a petition to begin the process to bring a relative to live permanently in the United States? And yes, they have. And it turns out about 10% have petitioned for relatives already, and about 6% have petitioned for children. So this is already telling us something about the data. Either, either those children that they are petitioning for were too old to be eligible at one one, or family is now in a better economic circumstance and can now meet the financial requirements for sponsoring a new person. <coughs> and again, I'm going to skip this detail and go to a second question in round two. Remember those conditionality restrictions? 
Well, there's a question in round two. What's happened? So here's what we have. About two-thirds of the samples finally to remove the prescriptions. Now, this is long after that two-year period. Okay? So a third did not find to remove their conditionality restrictions. And then you see that the conditionality restrictions were removed for 61%, the condition expanded for 3%, denied for 2.6%, and 8% had not filed. And interestingly, 19% denied having a condition. Now, we know they had a condition in Visa because when we drew the sample, we were given the details of the new fee card from the government. And those details include the Visa category. And the Visa category tells you whether there's a condition on the description. So the bottom line is that up to 39% may have lapsed into illegality of this group, the conditionality prescription group. So again, this helps us understand that the, how the, the, the combination of their personal circumstances and that extraordinary change in the U.S. political climate of immigration combined to reduce that long uh, response rate under 50% in volume number two. So now, last few slides. How to maximize the scientific data? Obviously, we want a new cohort. Obviously, we want, we want a round three. What else can we do? Well, administrative data exists on removal of conditionality restrictions. We could get that information for everyone if, if the privacy curtain were lifted and researchers were allowed access to those data. Okay? Same thing with green card removal. These persons in the 2003 cohort and the earlier ones in 1996 are way past the 10 year expiration of the green cards. We could learn. Who renewed the green cards and who did not? That would shed a lot of light on immigration, for example. Residential mobility. There's a government database, which we used when we were in the middle of data collection in round one, because at that time we had permission to use it. After that, the privacy curtain descended and you could no longer access those files. And those files are extremely useful in the example free tourism has gone because they are required by law. Green, green card recipients are required to file a change of address form. Um, I think it's within 10 days of the citizenship, naturalization among adults. This is something we could easily learn because there's a common identifier. <laughs> the right citizenship is more difficult to learn, but we're confident that combining the right kinds of administrative data, we could, we could nail that as well. And sponsorship is easy, because there's that form I-130 that every person must file if they're going to sponsor a So this would maximize the scientific payoff of the program enormously. And as I said, I'm hopeful, it won't be this year, probably not next year. These are political years in the United States, but I am hopeful that good sense and good judgment will prevail. How else can we maximize scientific payoff? Well, it's possible to design a study to, to look at survey effects, contrast to groups both invited to participate in human effect survey, and goes uh, not. This, this goes to that question that, that one of you asked um, uh, before lunch. Um, and because we would have that same information on naturalization, on green card renewal, on sponsorship, we would have for everyone, whether or not they were in the 
we would be able to tell whether having been invited or having participated had some visible, has some visible effect. It's that the differences in immigration, naturalization, English fluency, English fluency from naturalization data, for example. How else can you maximize the scientific era? Well, cohort data. It turns out that the 1996 cohort is very, very special. 1996 was the last year before the new, very, strict, very stringent requirements on, on finances, on financial requirements, kicked in. Okay, they all kicked in in 1996. So comparing the 96 cohort without uh, affidavit of support, etc., the 2002 cohort with, which were extremely bad. I don't know how many of you in this room are familiar with this, but for many years there has been this puzzle underlying immigration work in the U.S. and it is the following. There's a list every year of people who get rid of them. And we know from the visa number that some are principals and some are spouses and some are children. But we don't know who goes with them. Nobody's ever known. We tried. Many people have tried. And um, I, I think that that question could be usefully revisited. Looking at new immigrant survey data combined with administrative data, and it might be possible to formulate a protocol for going from those lists of individuals with new green cards to reconstituted families of green card recipients. And then, of course, more elaborate families, such as, as you can see here, um, uh, in the case of a spouse with a U.S. citizen visa, you have the biological children of the spouse or stepchildren of the U.S. citizen, and the U.S. citizen may have biological children as well. There's, there's some some results in the literature about that. Very, very little so far. And then finally, to maximize scientific data, interview entire families. In the new immigrant survey, we interviewed the main sample immigrant and the spouse, and up to two age eligible children. Okay. Now we know. Rebecca talked this morning about how we're learning, how the frontier of knowledge is moving. One of the things that we've learned is that we can't understand a lot of these issues, a lot of things that migrants do, unless we have information directly from all the other relevant actors. Because the migration process <coughs> involves many, many persons. So, for example, the decision to include eligible children in an LPR application and or to take them to the United States involves lots of people parents, children, a variety of possible caretakers, and competitors for the caretaker's time. So you need siblings, siblings, children, parents, parents, you need lots of people. And so for planning a, the, next, the next incarnation of the new immigrant survey, I think the plan would be to go from the household survey to a true family survey. Okay, this is what I've looked at. I thank you very much, and I look forward to your comments and questions. Look, I have time for one question for each speaker. Um, thank you, President. President. Uh, two questions. One for Guillermina, one for Pablo. Okay, so it's cool. Uh, Delfina, please. Thank you. Uh, so this question is for Guillermina. Thank you for the talk. In this study, uh, are you planning or do you have in mind uh, having instruments for measuring acculturation, enculturation, identity, formation for these people? 
or uh, it's just the uh, facts that we can try to put into it? That's a wonderful question. Uh, I was I was joking with Paula earlier about how when we first designed the questionnaire, we had a questionnaire that would last 10 hours. <laughs> and then of course we had to plug it, plug it, plug it, plug it. So yes, we have thought, we do have graphs about all those things. However, the only questions that are currently in the Joint Conservative are factual questions about language use, for example, with who do you use which language? And incidentally, there's a huge variety, and we learn a lot from looking at this data about what people are doing. Also, there's information on language history. So, what, what language did, did the person use when they were age 10 uh, uh, with their parents and aunt? Then there's also a religion history. And again, that gives you a lot of information about how they are changing. So, people who once had a religion, no longer have any religion. People who once had no religion, and we know who they are, most of them are Catholics, the former Soviet Union, many of them now do have a religion. Um, and, and a lot of that you can get right from, from that first one. And it, it starts to illuminate what, it's, what they are thinking about themselves. But of course, we have all those questions not yet used. Thank you very much, Yelena. Uh, is there any question from Elvin? Okay, thank you. Um, my question is how long it took you that um, to analyze the information because we obviously have like a lot of validity in data and how many people uh, analyze this thank you so the as you said there's a the time variable is a qualitative document there's a code frame developed for coding that information that is largely derived from time diaries of adult time use and then has appended to it codes that are appropriate for child specific behavior and so we have a team that codes that over about six months. And once it becomes quantitative data, it's much easier to manipulate. Mm -hmm. There's some amount of detail that things really do constellate around recognizable but distinct topics. So um, I, I think the, code, the coding is an accurate representation of what's in that qualitative data. Uh, it's a very widely used component of this PBS data. I can't give you a proportion of papers that are all for the time diary data. But these are the only nationally representative time, time use data we have for children. So it's a, it's a very widely used resource for a whole lot of things. But in, uh, studies of health behavior, sleeping, um, time with friends, time with parents. So a, for a variety of disciplines, it's a really unique analysis. Thank you. 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 Thank Kind of very important for the way on how we evolve over time. Uh, I think if, if if we ever get a cohort of children here, we will need to have some kind of that kind of calendar. So uh, I, I think that's one of the most parts of the child development study. So thank you very much. Uh, okay, so.